Hello and welcome to this enlightening podcast episode on mind-body integration. I'm your host, Devi Sunda, founder of Teletherapies and Breathe Thrive. As we are joined by a distinguished guest speaker, Chloe Aldum, to provide insights into this world of bourbon therapy and embed. As we delve into this holistic approach to mental health and chronic illnesses, are you ready to hear about bourbon therapy and embed? Chloe will offer a unique perspective further enrich our exploration. Stay tuned as we unravel the mysteries of these powerful tools and explore the applications in stress reduction, anxiety and depression management, and integrative care approaches. Today, we are going to delve into the practical tips, uh, real case studies, success stories, providing an actionable insights to enhance your mental and physical well-being. So without any further ado, let's welcome our guest speaker, Chloe Aldum, to the show and embark on the journey of mind-body integration. Welcome, Chloe, to our podcast, and thank you for your time today uh, to be present here and to share your knowledge, wealth of knowledge. Um, I would like to introduce you to our listeners today, and uh, I got to know you as a parent coach in one of the meetings. Yeah. And uh, then talking to you, I got to know that you are more than a parent coach and you have a right. loads of wealth of experience, which I was so fascinated hearing from you. And uh, I wanted to share to the world what you offer to people. And uh, I invited you and I graciously accepted my invitation. And I'm grateful for that. And thank you. And I hope you have a great discussion today on that topic. Mm -hmm. So um, the topic today is about the mind-body integration, uh, especially with the bourbon and uh, multiple brain integration uh, te therapies, yeah? Um, so I want you to talk about um, that shortly, and but I'm going to introduce to the listeners about who you are, yeah? You are bigger than what I thought, yeah? <laughs> I should admit. So... Uh, so complex. <laughs> So, um, so Chloe, Chloe Aldum has completed a BSc in genetics and master's of research in ecology and environmental management. And she has contributed to uh, various European framework projects. And um, Chloe, could you tell me uh, what are the European projects you were in? Well, there was once um, from the research station where I was based at the time, um, which has now become part of um, Rothamsted International. And then it was um, just the other side of Bristol, also allied with the University of Bristol um, at Long Ashton. And I worked on the um, one of the lettuce gene bank projects um, with um, another university in the Netherlands. Uh, and it was looking at how many seeds are they storing that are genetically identical that they don't need to store because mm. they're genetically identical. Mm. And so there were over 60, initially over 60 strains of different lettuces that they had to grow up um, in the Netherlands. And I was sent samples of DNA in order to check and see if they were identical. Um, so that it was a, a rationalization of resources. So I was using a DNA sequencer and a whole load of tools from, from that um, and working on those kind of projects to, to help um, actually trailblaze how to do this with, within other much more complex gene banks. Wow, so fascinating. And I'm not from that side. So hearing from this kind of research, it's really fascinating. So how do you then, I also see that you're a parent coach, um, you mentor people in simplicity parenting. So how did you then move on to that role then? Well, that role started much later on, um, after, after um, the, essentially after the birth of our, our first child. Um, which is over 16 years ago now. So we have three children. Um, and uh, I just kept on getting these compliments from people within a, a parent and child group at the local kindergarten where we used to go to. People saying, you're just so calm all the time. Uh, how are you such a good parent? What is it about you? And by the way, I'd like to know how to do it like you do it. Mm -hmm. And one of the kindergarten teachers introduced me to a book, Simplicity Parenting by Kim John Payne. And that was published originally, I think, in about 2011. And it's all about how to simplify um, your parenting life. And he's gone on and written um, a couple of other books, three or four other books now. 
And it's all about the essence of being at your best when your kids maybe are not. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was something that I was able to really relish doing and have quite a passion for because I could be this good parent. Good, well, things are certainly easier for me than many people. Uh, And I find it easier to deal with both emotional and physical problems and keep a calm head. And that has also stemmed from training my own horses, which uh, I know sort of fascinated you as well. And I found that my horses in the 20, they're now 25 years old, and I've had them since they were 18 months old. So how to train a horse and how to train children, there's so many similarities And I learned how to be a really kind of contained, calm being and person. Mm. And I took this with me to how to look after and be with young children that are also using a lot of body language to communicate. Again, it's this communication in the body and outside of the body. And um, I found I had a talent for it. Fantastic. So you're natural born parent yeah so I, I'm actually more interested in this the parenting part none of our human beings actually go for a class or session how to parent yeah and um, and also like we pass on our behavior of parenting from our parents who also pass on from their generation yeah it's and- it's behavioral modeling and it's it's fascinating because different parenting cultures as well pass it from all of these different ancestors that we have and we can also choose to break tradition and change and that for some people for some cultures is really really hard and I know that to be the case for so many different cultures around the world it's no 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 this is the way we do it and whenever you bring in that we that's a bigger thing and uh And it's totally possible, especially when you've got support of others around you going, this is the way that will be better. And if you think about the how people used to think that smacking was fine, well, it didn't harm me because I had it done to me lots. Well, did you learn from it? Yes, it's really sore. Did you continue doing what you were doing? Well, yes, it was fun to go and steal those apples from that orchard. Mm -hmm. We just had to do it more quickly. Mm. I kind of go well actually how about learning how to pick all the apples and share them within the community oh I didn't think about that and would the joy actually have been shown differently that way Mm. and then you go oh yeah that would have been much more nurturing and nourishing so you can change change things and change both inner aspects as well Yes, so, yeah. yes, you're you're totally right. I agree, and also like there's a part of emotional intelligence also playing in that role, isn't it? Like uh, how like we as we pass parenting from our parents, and uh, we are developing with that level of emotional intelligence, and then later on when we go through the challenges in our life, then we oh how to be calm, how to sit for five minutes without doing anything. Yeah, <laughs> that is actually the, oh, yes. the gaming world. I'm just uh, more kind of fascinated where kids are more into the gadgets, tied up to the gadgets. In my ages, I never, I had my gadget when I was in my university. Yeah, mm-hmm. my first mobile phone. Yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> now, oh, the kids actually, like the five-year-old or six-year-old is having the phone in their hand or any gaming tools, for yeah. example, they're having. And yeah. uh, the minds are raising a bit. Um, it's good. it's all to do with attention span. Yeah. And um, if you look at old films, um, so recently in our house, um, we looked at the film 2001, A Space Odyssey by Arthur C. Clarke. And the film is so slow. And yet back then it was fascinating when it first came out. That would be in the late 19, well, the, the film... 60s or 70s it was done Mm -hmm. and if you look at films now um, they have um, a very high frame rate but also every single picture and little screen picture um, it goes for maybe some in sometimes in the marvel films it will be two seconds two seconds two seconds and it gives a dopamine hit to the brain new thing new thing new thing and our our brains our head brains are fantastic at keeping up with this but our bodies are not, which is why some of the old Muppet shows 
are fantastic because you have this frame shot that might last 40 yeah. seconds mm. showing different things, different people slowly going. And that allows our whole bodies to stay there and be in that scene, feel emotions with them as they're rising and as they're falling. Mm. And now many films, it's just a quick, 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 quick fix. Yeah. And it's the same with social media, with TikTok, with YouTube videos. Mm. And yes, it, the lure of it is very, very high. And children do not yet have that executive function to be able to control this. Yes. And I'd right. suggest as well, many adults do not too. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I agree with you. And uh, I also see that uh, the interesting bit comes on now, where I see you have completed the M bit master coach you're a certified mm -hmm. mbit international when i heard this first uh acronym mbit what is megabytes what is that <laughs> i've not come across that and and, then you looked up and you explained to me and it is actually multiple brain integration technique which is fascinating and mm. which we'll be talking more about it today now in this discussion um so you completed that in 2021 and i you're also providing you're mentoring people on that and providing training uh, could you could you I tell provide, me more about it? I, I provide coach training. So I'm a master master coach and um I trained then to be able to deliver a four-day coach certification program um all about um the neuroscience and ancient wisdom practices of the the multiple intelligence networks we have that run throughout our bodies, um, in our head, in our heart, in our gut but it's also including our autonomic nervous system and everything that gives us information about how we perceive how we do our lives. Great, great. And that is more needed for our current present practical life, isn't it? How we react or respond to situations. Uh, absolutely, yeah. yes. And the more information that we can um, process and align within ourselves, so um, if you think about the pain network and a quick example from a um, uh, coaching experience, if you've got a hot plate, bright red, and you don't yet know that bright red means hot and you put your hand on it, you have a reflex arc that mm. goes, ouch, that's hot. Mm. But that reflex arc of that pain signal goes really quickly. And then the head brain goes, wow, what was that? Do we test that again? Oh, that was a pain response. So you can get a communication within our head to within our body. And then our heart kind of goes, oh, I don't like pain. And our gut goes, let's move away. So this, there's the way that our body will communicate with us. We don't really want to keep our hands on the hot plate. And yet, using that metaphorically, many people go around in their lives in emotional pain, because they can't make that decision yet because it's troubling them and so they're doing the equivalent of keeping the hand there and this kind of coaching allows them to go well what values mm. what what are you sort of seeking at a deeper need and and just finding out different bits of information mm. to share within the body of how to be different so it's a really, it's a beautiful coaching modality that um, just gives us more information, but it gives us better quality of information um, that we might not have listened to, especially mm -hmm. not in the past as well. When, especially in British culture, if you think about um, stiff upper lip, no mm -hmm. emotions, you know, it's, it's all up here and mm -hmm. don't cry, mustn't cry. You go, mm -hmm. no, that's, it's a body response. Mm -hmm. um, after trauma, there is a traumatic response of um, shaking. Mm -hmm. And people are, people are told, don't shake. No, 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 stop, stop. And the answer is the body needs to process this and shake. Mm -hmm. It happens in horses. When horses have been confined, what they need to do afterwards is be let free to gallop, to run around, to roll and buck, rear, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And that's processing and once that's done, calmness and balance can then be restored. Great. So big yeah. topics. Yeah, it is. It is. Actually, I'm um, more interested to, um, to know more about, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned about the emotional pain and the physical pain and a very good example of putting your hand on a hot plate and other things. Um, so do you then actually uh, 
from the embed part of it, integrating the three brains. What is the three brain then is connecting this uh, communication? Okay. Well? Um, well, some people have an issue with the word heart brain. Um, so I'm quite happy to explain that that it's a shorthand. There is definitely neural a neural network around the brain, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very very simple. It mm -hmm. does keep it keeps there's the pacemaker. It keeps the heart moving, mm -hmm. um, and it also does have the ability to store memories, mm -hmm. which is a new thing that it has been around. And I remember this being around when I was um, um, a research scientist as well, hearing on Radio 4, on Woman's Hour, a surgeon that came in mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. said, after heart transplants, because they're getting so good at doing heart transplants, that some of the nerve and neural connections afterwards do connect back uh, in a beautiful way. Um, mm -hmm. They were finding that um, after transplants that people's values would change and they would have little memories and one that's been documented is about somebody getting nightmares nightmares of interesting um, of somebody's face mm. and then they found out that the do donor had um uh, their heart had been um gifted but they'd actually been killed the person had been killed um mm. and the person's face that they kept on seeing mm. when they did a photo fit, they found out that the photo was of the partner of this person, but there had been no evidence. And this person, memories had lodged within the heart. Mm. They had then within, it takes about six weeks, between six weeks and three months for certain neural connections to go up into the head brain. Um, and then more sense was made of it. But there are plenty of stories where people go from hating Marmite, mm. heart, heart, transplant, heart transplant, heart and lungs maybe, and going, oh, what's this dark, salty thing? I love it now. Mm. And going to love sort of motorbikes and suddenly going and becoming thrill-seeking. Mm. And people are going, this is not the person we knew. So it's it's documented, It's there's totally valid um, neuroscience and scientific um, research mm -hmm. into how that there is um, a brain neural network around the heart that um, helps the head brain and frequently it's all to do with how we value things and we know and emotions and mm -hmm. the um, um, relational effect that we have mm -hmm. with other beings with other creatures mm -hmm. and with our world as well because we can have an emotional effect to seeing a plant Oh, it's in yeah. blossom. Yeah. And you can yeah. see the behavioral things that people tend to do is they don't go, wow, unless it's if it's to do with vision, they might do head expanding. But if they really, truly love something, it does have an effect on the heart. Wow. Um, so I'm, I'm fascinated yeah. by like you're confirming like you know the symbols what everyone says if you have a love you put the heart symbol. Yeah. And you're confirming here today like a heart as memory. Yes, yeah. it okay. does. Yeah, okay. it's very small, and it is there, and it's very. Um, it can be triggered. It doesn't have to be triggered by the sort of um, by what you're seeing. It can also mm. be triggered by what you're smelling because smell is an ancient sense, mm. and yeah. it's very, very strong, very, very wired in. Mm. Um, which is why some people will smell burning if mm -hmm. they're still deeply asleep, mm -hmm. and go straight to alert, awake and find out that they need to deal with the burning that's the that wow. smell that they're feeling okay. so um that they're, that they're sensing so yeah the scent of smell can go straight into the heart as well so if you associate your um a parental figure with mm. a certain perfume mm. and it's a good um it's a good mem well good or bad memory people mm. can be triggered they can smell something and go oh i hate that person but I've never met them before. Mm. And it's not just pheromones. It can be the scent, it, not necessarily the vision or the hearing as well, but they all combine. Mm. All of this information is mm. stored in our body in various places. And we, we are good at accessing it. Mm. Um, and sometimes things happen in our lives that just block things off. And um, you can go into grief as well. When we go into grieving, and you can feel the emotional kind of 
heartbreak. Mm -hmm. um, we hear in the news every so often when somebody dies and their partner dies within a short period of time afterwards, people go, oh, it's because they were heartbroken. Mm -hmm. And you find out that, yeah, it was a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And you kind of go, there is things get stored in there. Yeah. And the heart is a very, very powerful emotional um, kind of um, thing <laughs> within yeah. us. Yeah. And okay. it also could, yeah, so that's the heart bit. If I go into, um, shall I go into gut now as well? Yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> well, the gut brain, um, the gut brain has pretty much as many neurons as um, I think, uh, I think the analogy is, is, is like a cat or a dog, a cat's brain, I think. So you, you're looking at, there's lots and lots of, of nerves. And in some ways it's part of the, the first thing that, mm -hmm evolves in us in um, embryology as well mm -hmm. is the gut because um embryology starts off as a sort of ball and go to a disc and then that disc creates that kind of gut which mm -hmm. then get the forebrain on top the heart brain is there by six weeks um so the the first cells that are starting to beat and the cells that start to beat connect up together wow. uh, heart cells if you keep them separate um it's been shown you can keep heart cells separate they'll die but if you put two heart cells close by, even separated by a very thin film of glass, mm -hmm. they will start to beat in, synchro in synchronization Interesting. and they last longer. It's, it's phenomenal research. And that's been in the last, uh, within the last decade. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the gut brain. The gut has a lot of identity, safety, um, those kind of core deep beliefs and gut instincts and when we're talking about our gut instinct frequently the voice can lower mm. as we're kind of going it's deep mm. within us yeah. and our gut instincts keep us safe mm. so when we step on a, um, a ladder and we feel a ladder and we go oh I don't know if this is safe mm. Mm. and we trust our gut mm. Mm. and it doesn't always give us the correct information. Mm. We can have, oh, I trust that person deeply. Yep, got a gut feel about that. Mm. It can be absolutely spot on and that can come with experience. Mm. And again, this is behavior that we model to our own children mm. that um, you can be fearful of everybody. Mm -hmm. That's the gut instinct to kind of keep everybody else away. You can, you can train your children to have that mm. and be hypervigilant about everything. Is that a good way of living life? Yeah. Because we need connection. Um, so yes, the, the gut brain is all about the those deeper levels and it's all about our safety and our identity mm -hmm. and our kind of gut instincts and our core nature. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, a, it's a really powerful way of how we do our living and how we do our lives. Mm -hmm. um, it being one of the first things that, that develops and we um, we discover all of our identities by by modeling other people as well. And those instantly that are around us, our caregivers, mm -hmm. be they parents, but also those that are around us on a day to day basis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you. So uh, this is actually the gut brain and the heart brain. Interesting, actually, I'm really interested about the heart when you talked about the memory cells it, it, it catches me like uh wow then it confirms like everyone actually points out i'm uh, i've broken my heart when someone is actually breaking the relationship yeah um so it's more relevant and proved to be real it has a memory and um, yeah. so what is the other third brain then so what is the third brain you uh, well if we know so much about our head brain it yeah. is awesome it's fantastic. Its biggest job is creativity. Mm, mm. And if we think about um, in relation to the other brains, I mean, the heart, you could think of it as compassion. And you can think of gut giving courage mm, mm. Um, or the head. It's, it's creativity is phenomenal. And there's no other creature I think on on this planet that has the complexity that our brain has, mm. in size. Mm. I mean, yes, there's plenty more brains that are that have different sizes. And when you start looking at the um, the the brains of other creatures that have higher functions, like some of the um, 
um, mammals sort of in the sea where you've got the, the dolphins, you've got whales, mm. but you can also go sideways and look, look at octopuses. They have eight, uh, they have nine brains. Um, so they have wow. a brain in each tentacle. Well, mm. a neural network node in each tentacle, as well as a central one. Mm. Um, uh, but you've got high levels of communication mm. and high levels of ability to work mm. and collaborate with others. Wow. And if you think about the ancestors, primate ancestors, there is this collaboration of, OK, well, let's go on a hunt and get the resources that we need. Mm. But also the awareness of our environment of, well, if we collect it and store it, mm. then mm. we can do this. Mm. And then when we go more into um, our later evolution, where we've got um, the compassion starting, where they they've noticed that. Um, this is where people started to heal other people. Mm. Here's the evidence of a broken leg. Well, a broken leg in a chimpanzee, um, in a gorilla, they're not going to last unless other, other sort of members within the troop have the compassion to mm. give them resources so they can continue living and continue contributing. Mm. And so this is where um, then um, sort of homo sapiens, as it were, sort of, deviate slightly because we start looking after mm. the ill the sick the elderly mm. within the community to mm. share wisdom to be our um extended extended head brains for creativity mm. and for knowledge as well i mean that's something that the, the head brain is i mean there's so many different areas of neuroscience now i know that when i was at school there was neuroscience one little label Mm. Um, just like there was when I first started at university doing genetics, here's mm. genetics. And now you go, well, what aspect of genetics now? Because there are multiple fields within it mm -hmm. um, that's so deep. Um, and it's the same with, um, uh, with, with neuroscience. We don't know how our brain works. Not totally. Mm -hmm. How exactly does it store information? How exactly does our brain do so much but the plasticity it was originally thought that you know you, you can't teach an old dog's old dog new tricks mm. well there's plenty of studies giving um different age groups smartphones for the first time mm. and you can give a 90 year old a smartphone for the first time mm. i can't remember the age of the person in the study maybe they were in their 80s i can't remember and then they did MRI scans afterwards and they mm. noticed there were new areas that had developed in this person's brain in order to do the finger control, the wow. swiping, mm. the, the, the going through and the looking and the enjoyment factor of it. Mm. And so you're never too old to learn mm. and to change. And that goes into mindset as well of how, how to do this. Well, if somebody doesn't want to change, it's mm. very unlikely, unless big circumstances come along, that yeah. they will do so. There is always this inner choice. And yeah. again, we go into our brains. What's the reason why somebody gets stuck? Mm. It can be because they don't value it enough, mm. because they don't have the courage to, mm. or they don't have the, the, the thought processes to be able to get there. Yeah. And this is what in MBIC coaching, I can help people to do when they're either sort of stuck or blocked mm. and they don't know quite what's happening and and sometimes what can happen is the the equivalent of the head's thought it all through the gut says yeah let's go for it yeah. and I think you, could, yeah. you can take it into leadership where you can go which leaders have the creativity and gut-driven action we can mm. think of several on the world stage at the moment but how many of them are integrated with their heart and the emotional relational effect with other people yeah, and it's when you yeah. get people, and I think of various um, uh, people in on social media that people instantly relate to really well, mm. that have a really well thought out vision mm. that is emotionally connected with courage behind it, mm. and then people go, and I mean Martin Luther King has been used as an as an example of really well integrated mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with everything. People just go, I want to follow that person. Mm -hmm. and then you get other leaders where they where people wish to follow them mm -hmm. because they've got the dreams they've got the gut action mm -hmm. but then you look at something in the middle and you go mm -hmm. <laughs> not quite there yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it's aligning all of the, all of these things, and it it helps so much in parenting as well when you've got an aligned parent who knows what they want to do, who feels it's the right thing, and who puts in good boundaries for the health of the family and the child and themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah fascinating and uh, it's all true isn't it like uh, what you believe and uh, that's what you feel and that's what you act out and uh, uh, yeah. I'm talking from the CBT model and it sounds like some similar to that isn't it like uh, um, so in CBT like we actually learn about like it's the cognition and uh, and and we all talk about the cognitive distortions what people have the negative thought patterns yeah. and then um, and how to change it into a positive alternative and then how you feel changes and then your action become positive. Yeah, so it's, it's so interesting. And um, I, I just actually, why didn't I know this before? Okay, what is that is MVID? What is that? So I'm so interested to hear more about it. So, so mm. Connie, um, thanks for actually explaining uh, about the MVID part of it. And so fascinating to hear the three different brains and uh, the heart brain very much interesting everyone knows about the gut instinct isn't that we all talk about it but the heart brain is so fascinating to hear although like we all believe there's heartbreak symbols of heart and other things but ha heart has a brain and the example what you provided uh, with a with a heart transplant and the person remembers that person uh, it's it's so fascinating to hear and i like i, I now start to believe like we have memories in our yes. hearts yeah. And so now, can you give us a little bit more insights about uh, Bowen therapy? So you are a specialist in that as well, right? Yes. So I've been a Bowen therapist for um, over two decades now. Um, I got into that because the, um, the research um, station where I was working at was going to be relocated. And I knew my husband's job was going to alter locations. And I thought, what is there that I can do that I can transfer? And it's a skill set that I can take on, that I can go places with. Mm. And also knowing at some time I'll have a family. And it was just a whole lot of things going on. And we'd already had noticed that the station would be closing. And I had equine Bowen done on my horse. Mm. Um, and this is my my first horse who I had for 18 years. He was an Arab, beautiful Arab, and he was getting older and there were some problems that he was having. And somebody at the stable yard said, oh, there's a therapist who comes up and does stuff. And anyway, she's really good. Mm. And I didn't know what she did. I'd never heard of Bowen before. Mm. And I watched her and thought, and how's that going to make any difference whatsoever? You're barely touching him. You're not doing much at all okay, well, I'll see. And she told me, okay, give him a week off and um, and then uh, I'll come back in about a week's time. So right, maybe on day six, I'll be, be back here in a week's time. And I thought, well, I'm not going to make a second appointment because I really don't know. This is my head thinking a lot. Well, I ignored her advice of leave him six days and three days later, it was a beautiful day and I thought, I'll go out riding. Mm. and this is on a 20 how old was he then about 21 22 year old horse mm. um he still had plenty of energy at mm. times but just wasn't moving right and I got on him and he went right let's go mm -hmm. and he was doing he was moving so much better mm. and I was thinking um I think I'm going to just point him up this hill and let him gallop because mm. that appears to be if I don't give him the permission, he's just going to do it anyway. Mm. And um, it was also this un unleashing of trauma, unle make him checking his body out, how it now worked, because mm. the field that he'd gone in was not big enough to let him do this. Mm. And oh my goodness, it, it just made my mind go, yeah. wow, I believe in this. Whatever she did, it mm. really was that effective. Um, and so I just instantly made up my mind pretty much the second time that I saw her, I went, I want to train in this. And mm. she said, oh, fantastic. Not many people say things like this. Mm. Um, you have to train to do it with people first. And I went, oh, people boring. Mm. I found out later people aren't so boring. It's just that at the time I was very focused with horses. 
Mm. And I found out um, I, the Bowen therapy training takes a year. The equine Bowen takes also another year. Mm -hmm. And I'm very glad I didn't do them together because there's quite a lot of work that's involved in mm. this. And I've seen other people um, try and do it, but go, oh, I'm going to have to slip the equine bone. You have to qualify as a um, human bone therapist first mm -hmm. before you can qualify as an equine bone therapist. Because if you're the equine bone therapist, you will still need to um, see the effects that the rider has on the horse. Mm -hmm. um, so you really need that qualification, first of all, because if a rider has a tilted or rotated pelvis, where they sit on the horse, where their shoulders will be, where their head will be, if it's forwards, the horse is taking on all this information. So mm. it's good to be able to read the rider as mm. well as see the problems with the horse. Because you can treat the horse and then go, well, if I don't treat you, the horse is going to end up back in square one again. Yeah. So it's yeah. that relationship. So um, I went um, and did that. So when the research station closed down, I just seamlessly went and I'd qualified as a Bowen therapist. Mm -hmm. And what this is all about is it's a, it's a reset for your body. Like mm -hmm. so many bodywork therapies, mm -hmm. um, it's accessing all sorts of neurological layers underneath the tissues as well, mm -hmm. um, so that you've got various points that you tend to make cross fiber moves over. So mm -hmm. massage goes with the fibers of the body in general mm -hmm. again generalities because it's not always the case mm -hmm. Bowen will make little moves over the connective tissue and the fascia in general mm. okay so it's, it's it, um, i'm trying to understand the concept so the massage goes over the tissues in a in a in a vertical direction of the yeah, fiber. With the, if you think about it with the fibers of the body with the muscles okay. in okay. general Mm. and um, Bowen tends to be across the fibers not always that's mm. why it's a general thing and it's if you imagine um, a, a good way of imagining it is if you have a guitar string mm. if mm. you go with the fiber of the guitar string you can get an interesting sound yeah yeah and that's one example. thing mm -hmm. and when you go across the string you'll get a vibration being set up like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that is a kind of effect that we're doing with the muscle and there are certain muscles that I can do that with that you really do get the feeling of a twang mm -hmm. not not you don't get the sound yeah so it's not to do with um manipulation of hard tissue that a chiropractor or an osteopath would do so mm -hmm. I don't purposefully set up anything that mm -hmm. makes any cracks which is why bone um bone is used by many um osteopathic um, practitioners as well because oh, it's okay. just another adjunct to it and i can think of one of the um bone trainers when i was training two decades ago he was also an osteopath so mm -hmm. he did two trainings he oh. would train other osteopathic students or he would train um bowen um students as well Okay. Um, it's a therapy that that was that started up from um, a chap called Tom Bowen in Australia, mm. and uh, he had um, uh, he was influenced by other healthcare professionals at the time, in which there was very much osteopathy was the other alternative health provision that could mm. be done for people who had sports injuries, mm. and he was just very good at noticing and intuitively realizing and recognizing well when i've done this mm. that happens in the body mm. and so he was very much testing and experimenting things and other people um he taught about six other people um during his lifetime so there's a, an evolution of how he um taught people and what he was bringing to it mm. and it all became formalized to within a structure and a structure mm. of moves um mm. but it's not set because every single body is different. And the more experience a bone yes. therapist has, mm. the more you go, oh, there's something going on in the legs. Mm. And you can get um, um, differences, like somebody somebody might come to me, for instance, with migraine. Mm. Mm. And migraines are really head-based, but they have whole body-wide effects, for sure. And there's yeah. so, there are different types of migraines. Mm. So um, hormonal migraines, 
Mm. Uh, I can help the body reset that with mm -hmm. um, all sorts of spinal, sort of spinal muscular moves and the connective tissue around there and around mm. on the head. Mm. Um, as well as I can think of one person who um, came to me with uh, with that when I was living in Cambridge, where um, they had severe migraines frequently mm. and actually when i loosened the, all of the connective tissue around their hamstrings mm. Mm. and the hamstrings there's tissues that go of course from the from the hamstrings from the base of the feet there's what's known as the back line of connective mm. tissue it goes up your back and it actually parts of this tissue connect onto the brow ridges here and it was having an effect and when loosening off all of the other tissues, the connective tissues elsewhere, mm. just really slowly, really gently, yeah. um, compassionately to the body, mm. and the headaches lessened within a month. Wow. And it was phenomenal. And mm. even I was kind of, oh, I didn't quite expect this. Um, okay. And with regular treatment, and she didn't just do Bowen, after a while she went, well, actually, there's these workouts that I'm finding out that it's like this. Mm. Um, she also interspersed some acupuncture every so often because she found that acupuncture was really good for mm. the fact that she had had a car crash neck trauma mm. that um, I'd done work with. Mm. And, and so I, I work, I can work alongside uh, other therapies, mm -hmm. but it depends. You have to be careful because what's doing the most amount of benefit. So I like to suggest to people, don't mix and match everything. Mm. Mm. do a section of mm. see where you get to mm. if you wish something else do a section of mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. if you use a scattergun um, approach then um your body might end up being just very confused okay so you so, what you advise is to people like uh if you're sticking to bovine therapy then stick to bovine therapy and see the effects what it comes on so no don't jump yeah. into or it make could alternative other yeah, therapies. yeah. Mm -hmm. it was it's it's things that i just say take it take it sort of thoughtfully mm. so some people would mix um the more energetic sort of if you're going into sort of more um energy work mm. they might do um homeopathy reiki bowen um and even craniosacral therapy sometimes mm. Mm. and they'd avoid doing at this in the same week they mm. would avoid doing mm. um, osteopathy and physiotherapy mm. Mm. or even acupuncture it depends. And I'm not an osteopath and I'm not an acupuncturist. Mm. If they had knowledge of Bowen, what would they mix with their modality? Mm. That would be an interesting conversation as well, because yeah. it would be different because they would be taking on the knowledge of their experience yeah. in knowing this can mix mm. and that with that. Mm. Yeah. And so uh, I like to I like to tell people that it's your body. Yeah. So take it gently mm. and listen. And for some people, this is the biggest step that they've got is listening to the information that their body is giving them mm. because they want to be up here mm. and going rationally. I injured my ankle, so my ankle is the problem. Mm. And as a Bowen therapist, I look at the whole body and go, well, your hips, your, your pelvis is both tilted and rotated mm. so it's i'm not surprised that you damaged your ankle because of elsewhere mm. which has meant that your shoulder is like this which means that your neck is slightly cricked around so um and no i don't go walking around the streets analyzing everybody i switch it off mm. <laughs> but you can tell from people's um shoes as well when you look at their shoes where have they worn on the base of their shoes yeah yeah um, it reminds me sorry to interrupt it reminds me of the song like head body knees and toes like all should be in alignment all right like uh, that's what you're actually saying here and i'm just checking my alignment in the chair now where I can see <laughs> <laughs> my body is in a line position um thanks for this awareness and uh, so in terms of like when you talk about uh bowen and then embed um earlier um mm -hmm. Is this applicable only to the sports injuries or is it uh, having a wider opportunity to other conditions? How oh. can we integrate it? So, I mean, Bowen, Bowen is for, for bodies. Mm -hmm. However, the body contains your mind and all of the intelligence networks within it. Mm. So um, it deals not only with the acute injuries, 
that mm. you get that um, when something happens and you've got to sort it out. Mm. It also deals with chronic injuries mm. where they've been lingering in the within the body. Um, and I've, um, I mean, a, a recent client um, that I saw um, was in, in need of something because they were fearful that they might be getting long COVID. Mm. Mm. And um, the answer was one session, mm. I think, one session uh, and they will have they'll be having more but one session took them from feeling awful mm. and that was in their body as well as in their head mm. and I could hear it in their voice mm. croaky mm. and uh, and the bone work that I did was involving sort of targeting their diaphragm their mm. respiratory system mm -hmm. the kidneys mm. um I noticed a number of other things that I could have gone to, but again, you keep it simple. Mm. You start at one place and see where the domino effects go to. Mm. And there was a change with, by the time that I, they walked around and they went, oh, this is feeling different. And that's feeling different. And then I said, have you listened to your voice? And they went, I can speak without a croak. And then had a good oh. coughing fit and then went, oh, that's even better now. Mm. How did you do that? Mm. And I said, I pressed the reset button and your body has done the rest. Mm. And then from there, you can get to um, going, uh, I, I can think of one person where they had, they'd had chronic backache for six months. Mm. Um, they'd done a lot of strimming. They were working for the council. They'd, they have heavy machinery over the top of them. Mm. Um, I gave them one session and then I, followed back about two weeks later saying, well, you cancel the next one. What, you know, just let me know what's going on. And they said, well, that backache I've had for months, well, it hasn't mm. come back. Mm. And I followed up with, uh, um, with somebody that I knew that knew them. And they said, oh, they've, they've just stopped complaining about their back. Mm. They've not got the problem. And sometimes one just presses the reset and the whole body just goes, oh, this is back to normal. And other times people have conditions, so um, various health chronic conditions that mean that something regular is needed. Mm. And they've had a life of um, uh, IBS, a life of chronic back issues mm. stemming from a car accident in which a disc is moved and displaced. Mm. And then you go, well, there is functional, um, a pro there's a functional problem here which mm. will not go away. Mm. However, what we can do is help all of the connective tissue around it mm -hmm. to do the best it can. Mm -hmm. And so we can continue kind of that way. Yeah. Yeah. So you talked about like, uh, I can get an idea now, bovine and uh, is it only with bovine therapy or is it also MBIT also plays a role in whatever conditions you mentioned, like back pain and IBS? So, yeah, well, with, with back pain, um, back pain is a very wide spectrum the reason why some people can get back pain and i know um there's been uh, numerous little reports saying that back pain is the easiest way of uh of going to your doctor and being signed off sick for work mm -hmm. there was a there was a um a little report out in some magazine saying back pain mm -hmm. you can you can, and you go well why do you have the back pain do you actually have a functional issue that's going on a chronic issue that's going on Mm. or is actually the body creating it mm. because there's something else going on in in your head in your heart in your gut in the other this is another signal to mm. say something is wrong mm. so um back pain can also come about through things like um kidney infections so mm. it's one of the things where you do need a doctor involvement in this yeah. because something like back pain can just be that and mm -hmm. it can be other things but mm -hmm. yes our we are so good at creating issues because that's what our head brain is so good at creating yeah. that it can create a body problem mm -hmm. um and it can be a mindset it can be even phobias mm -hmm. can be created by the head mm -hmm. um so i have come across somebody who um, a very, very interesting case that this person had chronic migraines 
-hmm. and they affected driving, but they also affected talking Mm -hmm. and they affected their ability to think properly, Mm -hmm. such that I knew their partner had said um, uh, that if this person is driving, Mm -hmm. they then go things like, oh, what would it be like if I drove the wrong way along this road? Mm. And partner would go, ah, you're having a migraine. I need you to get off the road and we need to stop driving. Mm -hmm. and the bone that I did with them and also I did some work around their language and what they were how they were speaking about things and just noticing Mm -hmm. and um, within the six month period of time when I was treating them Mm -hmm. um, they lessened in intensity they got Mm -hmm. much and, and then they were gone for about three months and great okay, we've got this sort of system sorted then. Your your body is is responding really intriguingly. Mm. And I was left with this gut intuition that something else was going on and I didn't yet have the MBIT knowledge that I do now Mm. um, and also PQ coaching knowledge. And there was something, and they they said, oh, that's it, I don't need it anymore. And I thought, yep, that's fine. I will go with that. Mm -hmm. Um, And then a few months later, somebody said, um, uh, it was the somebody small words small circles they'd mm. return mm. Mm. and they had to be off work for them again oh mm. and I thought oh okay these mm. migraines are a really good excuse not to go into work mm. Mm. the brain w- can create symptoms mm. so mm. that they want to, don't want to go into work and this person said well you know, go back and, and see this bone therapist, see Chloe again. She's fantastic. You know how well it was last time. It's, mm-hmm. oh, I'm too busy. Mm-hmm. I'm too this, I'm too that. And over the course of the next two years, they mm-hmm. didn't come to see me. Mm-hmm. And I knew from other people, yes, mm-hmm. the migraines had come back, but they were useful. Mm-hmm. And so, so, well, it's, I'm just it's interesting. Now- it's interesting. What what is the reason they had this? Uh, I pronounce it migraines. Okay, so what what's that, the the reasons they have that then? Um, well, the reason the again from your neuroscience, yeah. neuroscience yeah. is still catching up <laughs> with some mm-hmm. things. I would I would say that there was a deep seated need in them, probably gut driven, mm-hmm. that having time off work was good for their mental health. Okay. That's the right point. What I want to take the discussion further, like anxiety and depression, the mental health issues is widespread. And uh, I just watching the American Psychology Association yesterday and there was a video on it saying that 350 million people have depression worldwide. Yeah. And 7% of the Americans. Is it that little? Yeah. Is it that little? (laughs) I I do agree. It it might be a figure which is uh, under underscored mm-hmm. there but like in when we talk about england we do have anxiety and depression rates mm-hmm. higher and uh, i just found out this bit here in the 2019 the studies have picked up like the adult psychiatric mobility survey that 20 percent of the adults have this anxiety or depression in england yeah mm-hmm. in 2019 so and that's that's increased i've i've seen um small scale um more like one in four yeah. and yeah. children and study. yeah. it's, it's children as well and it's children getting as young as six are being reported needing yeah. potential anti-anxiety medication which is kind of oh my goodness medication for little ones where like it's like actually putting the fertilizers unwanted fertilizer to the growing seed you know um so yeah. in terms of like how do you see this kind of the MBIT part, which is so interesting, the three brain integration, how does that work in this? Or you can also add on if there is any role of the bovin as well in the anxiety and depression. Yeah, well, as a combining all of our skill sets and things like this, um, you've got a body that is anxious. It's in a heightened state. So the you've got the um, sympathetic nervous system. So it depends on how technical we can go. The sympathetic nervous system, that's the one that's going the fight, the flight. Mm-hmm. That is really, really activated. Mm-hmm. And what Bowen can do as mm-hmm. a therapy is get the person to come out of that and relax. Mm-hmm. And that is partly through the connection of touch. 
Mm. And that's a very, very old system within the body that goes, you put your hands on the person. And as long as the therapist themselves is truly grounded and ready and communicating with mm. really good rapport with their client, mm. the client can't help but go, that and that deeper oh, second yeah. breath, mm, mm. that deeper second breath is activating the parasympathetic nervous system. Mm. And within coaching, you can add in breath work. Breath work is now becoming so much more mainstream. Mm. It really works. There are so many different ways. It's I, I know I know for a fact it's certainly within the military services as well, and has been for quite a few years. Mm. Box breathing, the mm. breathing to. Um, bring yourself down into more into the parasympathetic state mm. so that your head can really think. Cause if you get too much into anxiety and panic, mm. it will shut down the prefrontal cortex mm. and just allow again, instincts, your gut, your heart to get ready for action. But is it good action? Yeah. And when we, when we spend so much state sort of time up here, Bowen can access and get a body to kind of go mm. and do that. I can suggest it by being in rapport with them. Mm. And so when people are in really, really good rapport, you notice that heartbeats can sink. Mm. Nodding can end up sinking with the other person. Mm. Um, eye gaze can happen. You can get so many reasons how somebody can just go, oh, well, I don't know how this is happening but i'm feeling better just being in your company mm, mm. and that's also the the signals that bodies can send out the way that some people people go i like that person and they barely said anything they're just mm. nice to be with or you can be with that really dynamic leader that's mm. passionate about something and you go oh i'm magically kind of drawn to that person Mm. And it's not just what we're smelling or seeing or hearing. We're feeling it with other body senses. Mm. Mm. That happens with anxiety as well. Mm. It's infectious. So if you get one person that's really looking around, mm. then you, if you do that as a parent, your children will go, oh, I'll, I'll be look out too. Mm. And mm. so they, again, it's behavioral modeling. So um, putting embed into it is uh, if somebody's stuck in, an, in a state of anxiety, mm. it's finding out the trigger for it. Mm. It's finding out where the memories are about this. Mm. Um, it frequently goes into trauma work. And I'm not a trauma therapist. I know people who are. And I know when there are certain situations where um, I would then go, I can work around here and mm. this body of work is for somebody else because they are trained with that mm, mm. can i work with somebody who has trauma yes mm. i specifically will not work in that little bit there mm. if they have a traumatic injury that's different mm, mm. Um, so there, there has to be a lot of care taken for me as well as for them and that's where professional boundaries come in where you know that you have to safeguard yourself as well as your client and so anxiety, where it stems from, um, in my experience, again, limited experience with coaching. Um, I don't have decades worth of coaching, but I do have decades worth of being a person. Mm. Trauma frequently um, and anxiety stems from an incident that is traumatic mm. and it could be lots of small ones. Yeah. It can be from emotional neglect as a child. Mm. It could be from a traumatic incident of a car accident. Mm. Mm. And this anxiety, it depends on where it gets stuck. Mm. And if people associate into that state of anxiety, mm. oh, my, um, they can also use language like, oh, my anxiety doesn't let me leave the house. Mm. You go, oh, you've created a part for it as well. You've called it my, so it's mm -hmm. part of you. Mm. so it's weaving around um finding out the narrative behind it and finding release points where it can be well what what is your anxiety good for mm. well it mm. alerts me to things we don't necessarily want to switch that off mm. but what would you rather have mm. well i want to be able to breathe properly mm. okay so what's it like to breathe properly mm. 
and when should you breathe properly and when do you want to be anxious Mm. and to separate these two states out Mm. Mm. so and then I can go into different different ways of coaching with this in finding out what the person wants so Colly, that's very interesting actually um your interesting bit what i uh, picked up there was the breath work you connect the breath work and the box breathing mention and trauma work which is my uh my babies which i'm looking mm-hmm. after so as a psychotherapist and uh doing and also as a respiratory physiotherapist with over 22 decades um so it's uh, so interesting that uh coming from you uh, as well it's confirming again that the importance of breath work and how it can actually relieve the trauma and the anxiety bits and depression connected to trauma and that's 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 good absolutely yeah and uh it's so fascinating and and i can can find where we two can collaborate and work together which is so interesting and um so when you talk about like uh the gut and the heart and the brain memory yeah and you spoken about like uh, it can be by the childhood experience trauma can be a part of it it's stored so so do you think that the heart is actually then communicating to the brain like because it's a relational emotional kind of link so it's just storing in the ch- as a child so from small and uh, would you think then like as babies when the babies are inside the mother's body in the in the mother's womb like mother thinks a lot mother has a lot of anxiety depression like uh, pressure from outside pressure from personal and other things would you think would you then say that the baby's brain as it's developing is developing with this traumatic incidences transmitted from the mother is it is it coded in the genetics i'm just curious um, to know from your side how, what do you think <laughs> well then you go into epigenetics which is a field that Um, I have had a mild interest in because it's fascinating when you bring it into parenting work and ancestral work because it is it is it does end up being coding coded within our genes Mm. yes Mm. so um, there's a I'm I may not remember it properly but there was a um, an epigenetic study of when there was a, a famine in a Dutch town mm. that I can I can't remember the name of the the place, um, and then there was study done later on because the the people within the town didn't migrate or move around much, so mm. they had um, the the grandparents, the parents, and the children, mm. and so they could do it from stories mm. as well as from um, health records that had mm. been stored. Mm. and they found an effect a direct effect of the of the famine Mm. to the grandchildren wow okay and it is then passed i'm just trying to connect it it is passed from their ancestors and to that grandchildren wow yeah so and that is through and this was specifically through um that's right uh, elaborating a bit more this is when the the grandparent was pregnant at the Mm. time of the famine Mm. Mm. certain conditions within the womb and i think it was between the the three the three months to the eight months it could be three months to six yeah again my de- the details are hazy mm. um mm. they were pregnant certain stage of pregnancy mm-hmm. during this famine they had very very little food and then food came along later so the child became nourished later this mm. child became a parent mm. and the the so it would have been the eggs that were developing mm. when they when the fetus was in the womb mm. were affected mm. so that I think it was to do with cortisol cortisol response and food mm. in the grandchildren. Mm. So mm. there was a higher rate of, I don't know if it was obesity or gut-related mm. um, issues in the grandchildren. This mm. is the plasticity of our genetics responding mm. Mm -hmm. so um can it go the other way absolutely Mm -hmm. and it's things to be aware of that okay so when i was um i remember a a friend's phase phrase of they were very stressed during their pregnancy Mm -hmm. um and for various family reasons that were going on at the time Mm -hmm. um and they said that their child grew up in a bath of cortisol Mm -hmm. has it had an effect on their child Mm. And undoubtedly, yes. However, mm. knowing that, you can then end up saying things like, well, knowing this, 
we can look out for these issues. We can look out for these um, challenges that will mm. be there mm. and we can spin them positively yeah. and we can look out for it and, and adjust ourselves for mm. this. Mm. So, so it means that we're, we're just ready for, for when th the things that we need to look for. Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm most thinking is like uh, when you say that there's epigenic and there is evidence that uh, the coding is there in the genes and other thing, my brain now then traces back to when we're talking about the anxiety, depression, and we've led to this uh, discussion. I have been more uh, over the two decades into chronic respiratory disease population, and they have a huge anxiety, depression, and it's more or less we see them. It is about the perception of the healthcare provider, seeing them anxiety and depression because of their breathlessness that can be also related to their childhood trauma and other mm -hmm. things, what they experience. And that's the familiarity of the, the situation might be like, yeah. it's, they can link up. So what is that your ex from your experience, what you can uh, offer to people with anxiety and depression, uh, with the chronic respiratory disease population, how do you see them? Well, with a lot of chronic things, especially when, they, when you're coming to anxiety and depression, there's how much support has been in the past. Mm. And um, I can think of a, um, an aging population where therapy used mm. to be something for um, other people. Oh, excuse me, mm -hmm. one of our pets. <laughs> um, this is, hello everybody, this is Poppy. She interrupts when she's got the door open. <laughs> um, with anxiety and depression, um, many people are walking around with this mm. refusing yeah. any form of treatment for it mm. because it's seen as in in the british culture it's mm. been seen as well you don't want to you know cut your emotions off mm. just stay here cut them off mm. um it's not right to cry don't mm. put it you know it's it put it away lock mm. it away mm. ignore it mm. and the answer is it stores itself in the body Mm. um so there's the there's the book um the body keeps the score yeah yeah oh, just, sure. i know that book. yeah mm -hmm. anxiety and depression mm -hmm. gets stored in the body and ke keeps on being released mm -hmm. however it's got to be supported mm -hmm. nourished nurtured and transformation can then happen mm -hmm. um so with with anxiety some people um they don't know where it started Mm. Well, they do, but they don't want it to be known. It's in, it's locked away in Pandora's box. Yeah. And opening this box means that once opened, there might be an awful lot to come out. And it's got to be made. It's okay. Mm. Um, it's okay to let emotions out. It's yeah. okay to feel things. And so many people aren't aren't allowed to feel things either. So um, I can even think of, um, uh, it's when people get judged for their feelings. Brenny Brown has so much to share on this about blame and shame. Mm. Um, oh, you're not still crying, are you? But mm. your cat died months ago. And you go, well, actually a grieving heart can take up to two years to process and really yeah. fully get on from, sort of move mm. on from this. Mm. So you've just had somebody judge, shame and blame somebody. Mm. And this is why psychotherapy is fantastic. It's coming, it's providing those spaces mm. and it's no judgment, no shame, mm. no blame. Yeah. It's letting things out and it's letting things be processed. The association, yeah. the dissociation with various states allow people to feel. And that's something within, within MBIT and Bowen and parenting. You bring all of these together to say, your feelings are valid. Mm, mm. Your feelings are your body communicating with you. Mm. It's okay to have them. It's yeah. okay to snipe at somebody else. You get children triggering parents because the child does all sorts of things. I can mimic mm. some children going, uh, oh mm. my goodness, mm. you're doing that again. Mm. And the children will have copied this from film, from yeah, um, sure. their peers mm. around them, from, from their parents. Of yeah. the, oh, it's a teenage moment. Mm. They copy, they do it beautifully. They will exaggerate it. And then when they play it back to the parent, mm. 
Mm. The parent will potentially have that memory lodged in their body, in their heart, in their gut, in their head, mm. their, their whole wiring and of what their parent did to them. Mm. Kole, then it's interesting to hear that uh, you talk about this anxiety, depression and the stored emotions in the body. And uh, going back to my question about how do you see a person coming with anxiety and depression, having this chronic respiratory disease? Most of them, from my experience, I've seen them as um, as also I was sex therapist. I was able to give my bit of knowledge about the trauma part of it and other things. But it's not uh, not all physiotherapists or spiritual physiotherapists have the knowledge of psychotherapy. So when a healthcare professional is approached, um, especially respiratory physiotherapists, approached by uh, people with chronic respiratory disease having the anxiety and depression, we go like, okay, you do breathing. Yeah, we don't explore the other parts which is impacting them. Is it yeah. wise from your view, like if people don't have an additional qualification of a mental health, to refer them to specialists like you or some other specialist signposting them and giving the therapy? And what would you actually do um, in that scenario, advice in that scenario? Yeah, well, when there is any chronic form of any um, anything within the body, it's a multiple multiple people may be needed expertise in so many different areas to help the whole person mm -hmm. to have that holistic view of the whole body but in addition to the whole body you've also got um, their environment where they're at home mm -hmm. their environment with the people around them yes. so it's it, it's delving into other areas and uh, when somebody initially has that kind of here's the issue that's going on within the, the diaphragm within your lungs yes you can get that functional effect of let's teach you about how to use your breath mm. how to get the best from your breathing mm. to help out this mm. and then exploring then exploring that connection to the to emotions and to feelings mm. is really really important and i think um it's it's being recognized now, but it's not yet being put into and sort of woven into other therapies, um, mm -hmm. but it's mm -hmm. starting to. And that's where both you and I are at, where it's well, there is all of this more that yeah. can be done. Yeah. So you have the issue here mm -hmm. and you're really down about it. And it reminds me of a story of a, um, a GP and his trainee GP going to see somebody who can't move very well, who's in pain mm -hmm. and the TV doesn't work and they're getting depressed. Mm. Um, and the younger doctor initially is the doctor and trainer in training is saying, well, we could prescribe various medications and other things that will help. Mm. And the older doctor from experience says they're seeking connection and mm. their TV doesn't work. Mm. So one of the first things we can do is help them get their TV repaired so mm. they feel better. Mm. so there is more connection mm. um, and rather than go sometimes down um, a more pharmaceutical route mm. sometimes that pharmaceutical route is needed to mm. provide scaffolding mm. to do more mm. and this is where I mean this is where the NHS and other medical services do so well is they can put in that emergency scaffolding mm. Mm. and it's the other bits and pieces that are not yet coming in to everybody mm. that um for depression is there's not many at the moment there's not many routes out mm. of will you if you have depression and you're taking medication for this mm. um what's the route out to not taking medication mm. Mm. and if you can't breathe very well mm. it has an effect on your gut mm. it has effect on your boundaries and so much else through the body mm. that the effects of depression medication tends to suppress many mm. things mm. Mm. that allows other parts to then kind of go, oh, I'm glad that's not happening anymore. I can think more clearly. Mm. And then it's taking action mm. at that point. And this is where psychotherapy and other talking therapies and other physical therapies can connect up the mind to the body again. Yeah. And the body back to the mind, because there's an, um, I know there is a figure that comes out of 80% of the nerve connections from the body go up to the head brain 
Mm. There's mm. so much between the afferent nerves and the efferent nerves, the afferent going up, I think, if I get mm. that right. Um, mm. the, you've got so much information going to the head mm. that it is worth processing. Yeah. And it's it's a process, it keeps going. Mm. So when people do have trauma that's locked away in the past, mm. um, it still needs to be processed. Yeah. And this process can take time. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it's a short amount of time. It depends on the practices that are um, used. EMDR being um, an amazing therapy, mm-hmm. that um, there are other therapies that do... I mean, it, it stemmed from something that a, a behavioral modelist did in the 1960s. Mm. But EMDR itself has only been um, used so successfully for trauma mm. Mm. Um, for the last day de- in the last decade. Mm. Mm. So it is there and being aware mm. as a specialist that there are more routes for this person to be healthful and mm. be healthy. Mm. rather than going well here's your medication we'll come back for a review later Mm. and wouldn't it be fantastic to have a practice in which if somebody comes in um there's the whole day and Mm. there's the doctor's consultation other specialists around let's Mm. see how functional your body is let's see how how you're communicating inside yourself and where is your mindset what what's going in to your gut nutrition but what's going in through your ears? Who's speaking kindly? Who's speaking with toxic voices? Mm, and we have all yeah. these voices in our health, in our heads as well, that sometimes we are our own harshest critic yeah. and we judge ourselves as well as others, as well as circumstances. And it's, it's bringing out all of these voices and giving kind wisdom mm. a better hearing. Mm. a better vision a a better feeling Mm. and we've got more and more information Mm. um in this sort of well exponential change at the moment is going on so fast Mm. it's not surprising that our bodies can't react fast enough our brains can't react fast enough anymore yeah um it's just a, a a critical storm of things going on that we become aware of yeah, I do agree with you, um, Polly, in terms of like we all face this pandemic, yeah, and uh, the COVID, which I'm talking about. Um, and I think uh, if I'm right, it's March 2020, everything got a lockdown and like uh, everyone, yeah. like uh, no human, uh, human to human contact and other things. That's actually our body keeps a score of trauma, right? And, Absolutely. Uh, um, by Dr. Gabba Mate, isn't it? Uh, Body Keeps the Skull. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I love his books and his uh, creations. Um, so it's, it is it is actually now a big question for a healthcare system, where whichever part of the world it is, uh, any healthcare system, how you're going to look after your people whose body is keeping the score of the trauma from the pandemic and how are the other therapies are incorporated? It's coming, it's coming under the umbrella term of integrated care, how people are receiving integrated care and how they are using people who are offering the services to people in the community. Yeah. So bringing yeah. uh, care to the home of people. Yeah. So thank you, Koli, for your time. And it was so informative and I learned a lot from you and I hope our listeners also learned a lot. And um, so it, where can our listeners find you? Well, the place where I hang out most is um, on LinkedIn. So I can provide a link for that. That's my most up-to-date. I do have a website, which is um, chloealdom.com. And mm-hmm. there is one um, that will be that is being created at the moment called The Parenting Half, mm-hmm. all about where you'll find nurturing um, and nourishment uh, for all of your parenting kind of coaching needs and workshops that I'm doing. Um, Put in my name, I appear to be a Google anomaly. Anomaly, yeah, a Google anomaly because you, there's only one of me. Mm. If you spell my name correctly, there's just the one of me. So, um, yeah, and it's a joy to connect uh, with other like-minded people mm. who wish a holistic form of health mm-hmm. in which no one person will get you well, 
-hmm. They might be the, that triggering domino, but there's a whole load of others who will gift you their expertise so that health and positivity is where we wish to be kind of much more creative, compassionate, and courageous because yeah. we're going to need it. Yeah. Yeah, it's like a cake, isn't it? Our health like is integrated. Like a cake needs a mixture of content to make a cake. Yeah, so we Absolutely. have to, have a, to have a sweet cake. We have to be having integrated care. Absolutely, and you need yeah. the savory as well. The savory, <laughs> the sweet. Yeah, and they and you keep them in balance. Yeah, it's that balance that is so needed. It's lovely. Yeah, I love your analogy of the cake as well because yeah. all of those ingredients. You yeah. wouldn't eat them by themselves necessarily. Yeah. Flour, yeah. eggs, is yeah. that sugar? Well, sugar, okay. Some people do. <laughs> My children, for sure. Mm. Um, but when you put them together, the sum of the parts is greater. Yeah, yeah, I do agree. And I think like uh, your uh, your skills would be more also uh, into the parenting part of it, isn't it? Like uh, as an adult, their body is keeping the score and they are transmitting the score frequently with the interaction of the kids and yeah. uh, who are going to the future generation. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so you have loads to offer and I wish you all success in 2024 and thank you for your time. Brilliant. And thank you very much, Debbie. It's been lovely speaking with you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope today's episode filled you with bovine therapy, known for its potent healing effects, and embed focusing on the three brain within us. Offer a comprehensive understanding of our mind, body, spirit, well-being. As usual, stay curious, stay healthy. Signing off, Devi Sundar.